Welcome to Grace for Today with Pastor Lawson Purdue. Welcome, friends, to today's broadcast. I like how the Bible tells us that greater is He that's in us than He that's in the world. And this is my last broadcast to be teaching on spirit, soul, and body. When you get born again, you have the life, health, strength, and victory of Jesus Christ living on the inside of you. But we want to see that manifest in our body. Now, I used to teach that our body was just this dirt bag and, you know, God came to save it. And I know he made us out of dirt, but our body is an amazing creation and we're created by God. And our body is a place that we take authority and live out the victory of Christ here on this earth. So open your heart and receive God's word today. Blessings. Okay, so we talked about three kinds of people. Now, spiritually speaking, there's only two kinds of people. Notice in the spirit, you're either white or black. All right, you're either alive or you're dead. Christ is either in you, you're either righteous or you're a sinner in your spirit. You're either a believer or an unbeliever. So in your spirit, you have all of the good things of God. Now, as we talked about that, the Bible says this in Philemon verse 6 that the communication of your faith becomes effective by acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ. It says this in Philippians 2, verse 13. He says, it is God who works in you. That's in your spirit, both to will, that's in your soul, and to do, that's in your body. His good pleasure, spirit, soul, and body, right there in Philippians 2, 13. So when you have that life, when you renew your mind, when you bring your will and subject into God's will, and when you bring your emotions subject to the Word of God, then the life that's in your spirit will resonate through your body, and you'll look differently on the outside. Then, on the other side, we have an unbeliever. And in their spirit, darkness reigns. You who were dead in trespasses and sins, that's what the Scripture says. Has He quickened? You were made alive when you believed on Jesus. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God, 1 John 5, 1, is born of God. He, spiritually speaking, you're either born again, you're either born of God, or you're not born again. But Jesus said this, I think it's Mark chapter 7, verse 42, but he said, out of the heart proceeds murders, fornications, adulteries, evil thoughts, all these things. So an unbeliever does evil just by their nature. That, that is their nature. You don't have to teach a two-year-old how to rebel. They come by that honestly. See, the Bible says rebellion is bound in the heart of a child, but a rod of correction, you deal with their flesh, will we'll drive it far from him, okay? Okay, so but that, they come by, you, you were a sinner by nature before you got born again. So when you see an unbeliever, what's in their spirit will manifest. Now, they can put a good show on the outside for a little bit, but if you spend enough, just a little bit of time with them, you will see what the truth really is. Right? Jesus talked to the Pharisees and he, he, said, he said the Pharisees are like whitewashed tombs. On the outside they're pretty and white, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones. So spiritually speaking, you're either alive or dead. But if you're not born again, the fruit of that will creep out in different ways in your life. And I don't want to be the best sinner that ever made hell. So in your spirit, you're either a sinner or a saint, but you're not a combination of the two. You're either righteous or you're unrighteous. You're not a combination of the two. And when you're born again, you have the very righteousness of Jesus. You were given the righteous, righteousness of Jesus as a gift. That's on the inside. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that you might be made the righteousness of God. You are made righteous when you're born again. Now, the second, the other one that I have on the bottom of this graph is a believer who they've been born of the Spirit, but they've not renewed their mind. They've not brought their will in subject to the will of God or the emotions uh, subject to the Word of God and the will of God. And so their spirit is changed, but because they've not got their, their mind renewed. Now, when we talk about mind renewal, we're talking about a complete renovation of your mind. And because we're in a world that's been affected by sin and by Satan, that isn't something that just happens one time. It has to be a constant process because the world is always working on you. That, you know, <laughs> immediately when the word's sown, the enemy comes to steal the word out of your heart. And so you just constantly have to guard your heart. And when we talk about your heart, that's a combination of your spirit and your soul. And in about 98% of scriptures, the heart is actually talking about the soul more than it's talking about the spirit. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 
So if you've been born again, if you keep thinking like an unbeliever, you're going to see the manifestation. Like if you keep thinking like an unbeliever, you'll see manifestations in your body that are more like an unbeliever than a believer. Praise God. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. You've got to change in the realm of the soul so you can see the life that's in your spirit manifested to your body. And that's why there are many people who've been born again, but they haven't renewed their mind. They haven't brought their will in subjection to God's will. They haven't brought their emotions subjective, sub subjective to the Spirit of God. And, and on the outside, they don't look a lot different than the unbelievers. But if you'll renew your mind in the Word of God, and that's a constant. And mind renewal is not just cramming your brain with scriptural facts. Mind renewal is the process of changing your mind to think like God thinks, to where you see from the viewpoint of God. You see yourself the way God sees you. You see God for who He says He is, and you see others the way that God sees them. The Scripture actually says that we're to know no man after the flesh. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it's talking about a new creation. Just before that, in verse 14 to verse 16, He says, Know no man after the flesh. And so we need to be led and directed by the Holy Spirit and begin to think like God. Praise God. Now, when you do that, your spirit's the source of life, health, strength, and victory. When you renew your mind, when you surrender your will, when you get your emotions subject to the Word of God, what will happen is the things that are in your spirit will flow through your soul to your body. Now put up the bridge graphics. So the soul is the bridge to better living. And in your spirit, you have, for instance, in your spirit, you are completely wealthy. In your spirit, you have authority. In your spirit, you reign as a king. In your spirit, you're the righteousness of God. But if you don't uh, get it through the soul, you'll never see the manifestation of, of authority. You'll never see the manifestation of wealth, of prosperity, of peace, of joy, of all these different things in your body. The same way with divine healing. In your spirit, the moment that you're born again, you're as healed as you ever can be. But you must renew your mind to let those things that are in your spirit flow to your body. The Bible says the spirit of man will sustain him in his infirmity. Praise God. Now, how do we deal with that? Because many times we're over here in the body, and in the body it looks different than what God says about us. For instance, in the body it might look like we can't pay our bills. In the body it might look like we're sick or like we're poor or like we're defeated. But like we said last week, we're not over here. We, we are not a poor man trying to get wealth. We are not a sick man trying to get health. We're not a sinner trying to get righteous. We are. We need to live from this perspective. I am the righteousness of God. The devil may be trying to get me in sin, but I am the righteousness of God. Amen? I'm blessed by the Most High God. I'm favored. I'm prosperous. Amen? And when you understand that, when you understand that you're rich, you have all things. You're king. You reign with Jesus. You have authority. You have dominion. Praise God. You start, you start living from a different perspective. And so I have a hard time not seeing opportunity because I see from this position of victory. I see from who God made me to be. And I reign in life. And if you'll begin to see life like God, see, see yourself the way God says you are, see God for who he is, if you'll begin to look from that perspective, you'll begin to walk in a new uh, realm, praise God, and you'll begin to see the victory that is in your spirit manifest, flow through your soul and manifest in your body. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 29 to verse 30 says this, no flesh should glory in his presence. That's talking about this physical man. That's talking about this physical identity, right? But he says in verse 30, but of God, of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto you wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So you could say this. You could say, I am of God in Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I'm the righteousness of God. I've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus and I am redeemed from every curse. That is a spiritual reality. You are of God in Christ. Christ of God is made. It's not something that you do. It's something that he made you. He is made unto us. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 
But he goes on in verse 31 and says that according as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. You've got a glory in who you are in the Spirit. Praise God. So if you begin to see things from this new creation reality, from who you are in the Spirit, you will begin to operate from authority and you'll begin to operate from dominion and you'll begin to see the things that are in your spirit flow through your body, through your soul and manifest themselves in your body. But if you just keep looking at the natural realm, if you keep saying what you see, you're always going to have what you see. So what you got to do is begin to see from the perspective of the Spirit and say who God says you are. Say what you believe. And if you continue to say what God says about you, you'll begin to see. And you're not saying it to make it happen. It's not mind over matter. You're not trying to convince your mind. It's, it's, that's, it's just the way it is. So when you begin to see yourself as prosperous, as healthy, as strong, as blessed, when you begin to see yourself as a king, when you begin to see yourself ruling and reigning, you'll just start to talk differently. You'll speak differently. You'll think differently, praise God. And eventually that will come to pass. And you may even try to keep it hidden, but eventually everybody will know it because you can't hide it. It, ju it just becomes evident to everybody. Amen. But we're talking about the body and the body is where we walk out the victory. And if you get the picture of who God says you are, you see what God is doing. He's working on the picture on the inside of you. And if you can change the picture that you have of yourself and begin to see yourself the way God sees you, your life will change. But if you see yourself as this poor, defeated, sick slave, you're going to keep living like a poor, defeated, sick slave. If you start seeing yourself as a son, as a daughter, as a child of the Most High King. Start seeing yourself ruling and reigning with Christ. Start seeing yourself having all that you need. Start saying, I got money running out my ears. Thank God I got more than enough. Amen. I have everything I need to do, everything God called me to do. I have no lack in any area of my life. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Start agreeing with what, like Paul, he's in the Philippian jail and he's there for preaching the gospel and he starts saying, I have all and I have bound. Thank God I have received. My God supplies all my needs according to his riches in glory. Amen. Coming up next on Grace for Today. So we are to present our body as a living sacrifice. This is not my body. A sacrifice is something that I give to God. It is God's body. Gain a deeper understanding of how God created you. In this fundamental teaching, spirit, soul, and body, you will learn about the transformation that has already taken place in our spirits, causing transformation in the physical realm around us. You can get this CD series today for $14 with free shipping. Call 719-418-4000 or visit us at LawsonPurdue.com. When you partner with Grace for Today, your monthly donation helps proclaim the gospel to over two-thirds of the planet. You also help us support over 30 of our outreach partners, reaching those in need all across the globe. Every dollar works hard, so your gift of any and every size makes a difference. Please. Join our partners and all of us here at Grace for Today to reach more people with the good news of God's grace. Call 719-418-4000. See, this is what Isaiah said. Isaiah said he sent his word. That's Psalms, actually. And healed me. Isaiah said, by his wounds, I was healed. Start saying what Jeremiah says. He restores health to me. Start saying what Peter said. By his stripes, I've already been healed. Start saying what David said in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of my iniquities, who heals all of my diseases, who crowns me with loving favor and tender mercies. Amen. Who's redeeming my life from destruction? Who satisfies my mouth with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagle? Start seeing, saying what God said about you. Start agreeing with God, and then you'll start seeing a manifestation over here in your body. Now, what's the Bible say about your body? Well, it says a number of things. First of all, your body is a creation of God. 
In Psalm 139, verse 13 to verse 17, it says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. It says that when you were created, God has his hands on you in your mother's womb. He said he, he wrote your members in a book. And with all the billions of people on the earth, there's not one person that has fingerprints like any other. You are a unique creation of God. You are the highest of God's creation. Then the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17, it says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And the Spirit of God lives in you. In the Old Testament, they had the temple. The outer court had a laver and had an altar. That was to deal with the sins of the flesh. The inner court had three pieces of furniture. It had a candlestick. It had a, a table of showbread. Right? And it had an altar. And that represents the soul. And the inner court, where the high priest went, had this veil that separated it between the, from the outer court. And the high priest went once a year, and he took blood for his sins, for the people's sins. And it represented the presence of God among his people. When that, that's talking about the spirit. And it's a type of the spirit of man, where God dwells. And, and when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. It was showing two things. Number one, the Spirit of God was going to come and live in the hearts of men. Number two, it was saying that we had access to the presence of God, 365, 24-7. Amen, that we can live in the presence of God. Amen? We don't have to wait for another day. Why? Because Jesus already shed his blood and paid the price. Our spirit's been, been made righteous. Now the spirit of God comes and lives in us and we can go live in the presence of God. Amen. Amen? So your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It goes on and says, do not defile the temple of God. You should not defile your body. You should not defile your body with fornication. You should not defile your body and not taking care of it properly. You should take care of your temple because God lives there. Then it says this in Romans 12. He says, I beseech you now, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice to God, which is holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. So we are to present our body as a living sacrifice. This is not my body. A sacrifice is something that I give to God. It is God's body. It is God's property. Amen? That's the way I raise my children. These are not my children. They're God's children. They're God's gifts to me. And I'm trying to find out what God has invested in them and get them pointed in the right direction so they can do what God called them to do and be who God made them to be because that's where they're going to do the best. So my body is a unique creation of God. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm to glorify God in my body, and my body is a living sacrifice where I live out the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God as I renew my mind. The next thing is my body is a place of authority. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter, excuse me, chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 14 through verse 16. Hebrews chapter 2. Notice what the writer of Hebrews says, he says in verse 14, for as much then as children, that's speaking of us, are partakers of flesh and blood, physical body. He also himself, Jesus, likewise took part of the same. Jesus came in a physical body that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So, there's two reasons Jesus came in a, as a physical body. Number one is because God gave authority to a man in the garden. And so God had to get authority back through a man. So God sent Jesus as a perfect man and Jesus as a man lived without sin. He was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. Secondly, Jesus came in a physical body because the only way he could die is by coming in a physical body. If he wouldn't have come in a physical body, he could not have died. And when he died, he took our sin and he went to the grave and he spoiled principalities and powers made to show them openly triumphing over them in it. Ephesians 4 says he took captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Revelation 1 verse 18, Jesus came back and John saw him in his resurrected glorified state and he, Jesus said, I am he that lives and was dead 
Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. The devil no longer has the keys. Jesus has the keys, and Jesus has given them to us as believers. So Jesus came in a physical body, number one, so he could die and conquer the devil, and number two, so that we could operate in our God-given authority. And when you're born again, you have been re restored to a place of authority as a believer. And God's dominion is is your dominion. You are to reign in life as kings through the righteousness of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you really understand grace and righteousness, you ought to be living like a king, not living like a slave. You are no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer a slave to sickness. You're no longer a slave to poverty. You're no longer a slave to anxiety. Praise God. You are a king if you'll begin to operate from the realm of the spirit and who God says that you are. Amen. That's what, when Nicodemus came to Jesus in John chapter 3, he said, Jesus, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. The question was about miracles. And Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot operate in, in he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Or you cannot operate in kingdom authority unless you are born again. There's two, two realms you must operate in to have authority on the earth. You have to have a physical body. You cannot operate on the earth without a physical body. And then you have to have a born-again spirit to operate in the authority of God. And when you're born of God and you've got a born-again, recreated, righteous, sanctified, justified, holy spirit, God's dominion is your dominion. The heaven is the Lord's, but the earth as he made for the children of men. This earth is my place and I have authority here. Amen. So, amen. So Jesus came. And gave us a physical body. So, and God gave us a physical body. Jesus came so that we could be restored to a position of authority. So, our body is our place of authority. Secondly, our body is a place of identity. You have a specific identity. There's nobody like you. Guess what? I wasn't born to be an NBA basketball player. It's evident when you look at my body. I had to take a life insurance physical the other day, and when the girl measured me, I said, oh, no, that can't be right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Measure me again. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you have a physical body, and you are a unique creation of God, and you've been created for a purpose. And the Bible talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter. 15, verse 37 to verse 41, and he says, God gives specific grains, bodies, and they have a purpose. Some of them are wheat, different ones. And then he says, there's a glory of heavenly bodies and a glory of earthly bodies. There's a glory of the sun and the moon and the stars. Your physical body is given a glory, is given a purpose that you're to operate in as a believer because God made you as a unique creation so that you could fulfill a specific purpose in the earth. I'm a man because God made me a man. Barbara's a woman because God made her a woman. And Barbara's not trying to be a man and I'm not trying to be a woman. <laughs> Why? Because God made me that way. My body has a specific identity, and that's how God made me, and I'm going to walk in what God made me to be. Amen. Be who God made you to be, and don't get mixed up about it. All right. Hallelujah. Not only that, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49 to verse 54, as we have borne the image of the earthly Adam, the physical man, we will bear the image of the heavenly Adam, Jesus, the spiritual man. He says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But I show you a mystery. We're not all going to die, but we're going to be changed. It's going to happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and those of us who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be at the Lord. I just added in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 <laughs> first, first Corinthians 15 verse 51, right, to 54, and then... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to verse 18. Okay, so I just tied them up together. But they're talking about the same thing. Now there's some people say, I don't believe in that. Well, listen, Jesus is coming back and it's in the Bible. Whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. Yeah. 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 Somebody say, well, what do you believe about it? 
Well, I don't care what you believe about it. What the Word says is going to happen. <laughs> so I believe whatever God said in the Word. Some of it I know and some of it I don't know. But what He said is going to happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So my body is a unique creation of God. My body was created to glorify God. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which I have of God. My body is to be a living sacrifice for the Lord. My body is my place of authority. My body is my place of identity. And when Jesus comes, I'm going to get a glorified, immortal body that's never going to deal with some of the stuff that I deal with in this body. So what's my conclusion to all this? Jesus lives in us. Let him live through us. Amen. Jesus, everybody say, Jesus lives in me. I'm going to let Jesus live through me. That's it. Christ in you is the hope of glory. See, he is the head. You're the body. Your hands are Jesus' hands. Your feet are Jesus' feet. Amen? So start letting your hands and your feet go do the works of Jesus. Because he said, he that believes on me, the same works that I do. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. My wife, Lisa, and I love coming to church again, really hearing the word, really engaging in worship, and being part of a body of believers that really believe in the supernatural, who believe Jesus is still alive and well today. When pastor would teach, it was just the word. It wasn't, it wasn't an opinion. It wasn't theory. Whatever he has to say is amazing. And he reads right out of the Bible, and I love that. Learning how much God loves me and, and that what Jesus has already done, I, it just set me free. We learned it wasn't about our actions. It wasn't about what we were doing or saying. We learned it was all about the work Jesus done on the cross over 2,000 years ago. It's not about growing a big church, it's about growing big people in God. Remember, you can get the entire series of the message you heard today for only $14 with free shipping. Just give us a call at 719-418-4000 or visit us at LawsonPurdue.com. We've really enjoyed having you be a part of today's program. And I want to let you know that this is the last program that we'll be sharing this special offer on Spirit, Soul, and Body. And this one teaching may have transformed my life more than any other. And so we want to get these materials into your hand to help you receive the good things of God in your life. Have a blessed day. Thanks for watching Grace for Today with Pastor Lawson Purdue. Our broadcasts are made possible because of faithful partners like you. Please consider joining our circle of partners to bring God's Word to more people through the outreach of Grace for Today. Go to www.lawsonpurdue.com for more information. Call us at 719-418-4000 or write us at Post Office Box 60722, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80960. Thank you so much for being a part of Grace for Today.